Thank you. Well, we had a creative conference this week. We had a missions training intensive this week. We had a heaven in business thing this week. If you were bored, you, it's your fault. It's just your fault. All I can say is there's more things going on, and most of it I don't even know about. They just do it. They just do it, and then I find out later. Actually, that's only partially true. God promised men that good, obedient wives would be found in all corners of the earth. And then he made the world round. And he laughed, and he laughed, and he laughed. I, this, this, one's, this one apparently was put in a church bulletin. A, today's talk will be entitled, From Cannibalism to Christianity. And then there was a note that it would be followed by finger foods. <laughs> Someone should have caught that. That's, <laughs> that's just not right. This, this I've, I've, I've done in the last year, but it's still one of my favorites. The pastor had a dinner at the home of a couple in his church. After he left, the wife said to the husband, I think he stole our spoon. It bothered her for a whole year. A year later, the couple had the pastor for dinner again. Unable to resist, the wife asked, did you steal our spoon last year? The pastor replied, no, I put it inside your Bible. Oh. I hear angels singing on that one. That one is just so good. That's, that's just good. It's, I have one more here. Let me see if I can find it. Vegetarians, you guys are the most forgiving group in this church because of what you endure from me and the rest of the team. I'm giving you another chance to be Christ-like. <laughs> Vegetarians live up to nine years longer than meat eaters. Nine horrible, worthless, <laughs> baconless years. <laughs> one, one sign I saw said, bacon, they say bacon, each piece of bacon removes nine minutes from your life. If that were true, I should have died in 1775. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, enough of that, enough of that. <laughs> uh, why don't you open your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 10. We're going to start there. We'll end up in John and uh, we've got a series, The Life of a Disciple, and this is week two. Chris Cruz did last week. If you weren't here, I encourage you to get it online. And next week, we've got a real special uh, surprise for you. The issue of discipleship. Jesus um, did not command us <clears throat> to make converts. He commanded us to make disciples. The word disciple means learner. I remember Winky Pratt used to tell us years ago, he says, when you stop learning, you stop being a disciple. The whole issue of discipleship is that we learn by following. We're actually following in the footsteps of another. It's not mimicking a lifestyle. It's not a code of ethics. It's actually a relational journey of trust. This relational journey of trust is maybe best illustrated by Jesus' own crucifixion. He gave himself to die. His life wasn't taken from him. He gave himself to die. It's my personal conviction that he didn't raise himself from the dead. The Holy Spirit of God raised him from the dead. So if you think about this for a moment, when Jesus gave himself to become sin, it's, it's the most bizarre thing. In heaven, we'll understand it clearer. But the problem in all of creation was sin. I realize the devil is an issue, but the devil has never been an issue for God. There is not a conflict in the heavens between God and the devil. The devil's a created being. With a breath, he can be destroyed. 
That's a subject for another time. But he is not the issue. Sin was the issue. And sin had only one possible solution, and that was Jesus becoming a, the Lamb of God who lived perfect in life without sin could be an offering for us. And in doing so, the Bible said he became sin. So if you can picture now, the problem in the universe, in all of creation, is this one little thing called sin. And Jesus became that. So that when the Father poured out his wrath on sin, it actually took the life of his son. So when Jesus offered himself as an offering for our sin, it was the ultimate expression of trust because God would have to raise him. The life of a disciple is the same daily decision. The life of a disciple is pick up your cross and follow me. It is the daily decision that I am going to deny what I could do for myself because I expect at the right time you will do it. We have a part of the gospel that throughout history we've done fairly well with. We, we know what it is to seek first the kingdom, at least in part. And we love when we see and hear of people in the body of Christ who have put the, put the king and his kingdom first. So we know how to seek first the kingdom, but we're not always happy with people for whom all things are added. It's the result of seeking the kingdom first. We love when people humble themselves under the mighty hand of God, but we're not always as happy with them when he exalts them in due time. We love knowing the stories of people who have given sacrificially in secret, but we're not always as happy with them when they are rewarded in public. Part of the issue of our calling to the cross is actually deal with the issues of jealousy and selfish ambition. Because without that, there, there can be no reward of resurrection. Let me put it differently because that, that seems to compromise the gospel a bit. Let me illustrate it this way. My job is the cross. His job is the resurrection. My job is the cross. I have no responsibility to make sure I get rewarded for my choices. I have no responsibility there. I only have responsibility for the yes. To walk redemptively in relationship. Monitoring this part of my life, my inner world, is to make sure that jealousy doesn't consume my life. That if I see somebody promoted where I thought I should have been promoted, then I have an opportunity for the cross. Never turn down an opportunity to die. Never reject an opportunity to die because rejecting an opportunity to die is to reject your opportunity for resurrection and reward. But it is a relational journey of trust. I say no here because I believe the issue is settled with him and he'll make sure in due time is taken care of. So the one who gives in secret is rewarded openly. Sometimes the people that are criticized the most often in the body of Christ because they are outwardly blessed are actually people that bore a cross in a very difficult situation and the Lord determined to reward them openly. Amen. But because we don't always know the backstory, jealousy stirs up and it masquerades as discernment. It masquerades as discernment, giving us information that is illegitimate information. Jealousy, bitterness, all those things will always deal with concepts, proof, evidence that you're right. Bitterness and jealousy, that's not the subject today, but just give me a moment. Bitterness and jealousy will always provide you with enough information to keep you in deception. 
and it will feel like reason. What the cross does is the cross in the life of a believer goes to the root of the issue so that it's much easier to recognize, oh, that's, that's jealousy, that's not discernment. That's self-promotion. That's not seeking first the kingdom. And the clarity with which we see, the clarity with which we think is much better doing the crosswalk than otherwise. The gospel of Matthew chapter 10. Did I tell you where to turn? Matthew 10? Good, all right. The gospel, uh, Matthew chapter 10 is one of the more challenging chapters on the subject of discipleship. Jesus is just in our face. And I, I, I love these chapters. I love these chapters because I, I, I want my wrong thinking to be exposed. Amen. Don't go very long without reading these verses because otherwise you'll develop a form of Christianity that has nothing to do with the cross. Now, let me just insert here. In in actuality, the resurrection is the Christian life, not the cross. But you can't get there without the cross. It's clear as mud, right? All right, well, we'll, just, we'll keep pressing it. So in, let's just read a couple of verses here. Uh, verse 37, Matthew 10. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He who does not take up his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's read all three of those verses again because you look so encouraged and edified. <laughs> let's, let's go after this while we can, all right? Verse 37, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Can you imagine if Jesus were around today and there was no Bible, and he made that statement, what social media would do with it. <laughs> there would be posts all over the internet on how Jesus wants you to hate your parents yeah. and, to, and to hate your children. It's weird. I saw a sign once that said, on the internet, you can be anything you want. Why do so many people choose to be stupid? I read it somewhere. It's, 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 it's not the opinion of the management. Actually, it is. All right. Verse, verse 38. He who does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. I remember years ago, one of our leaders in Weaverville gave this illustration that I, I, I used often. I, I think of it often. There was this old man in a rocking chair and he's rocking back and forth and there's a cat next to him. And he's, with each rock, he strokes the cat. He's petting the cat from the tail towards the head. And somebody says, you're petting the cat wrong. And he said, well, then let the cat turn around. And if there are things that Jesus says you don't like, you'll be the one that has to turn around. You have to adjust your position until what he says is the obvious expression of a good father. And until that position is acquired, if you will, that posture of the heart, until that position is acquired, what Jesus says will constantly offend. He, he doesn't mind, he, what he says never contradicts scripture. We know that. But he doesn't mind contradicting my understanding of scripture. I think he delights in it actually, just between you and me. And he doesn't mind drawing or creating conflict within scripture. In this chapter, he says, don't think I came to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. And at his birth, it was announced, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace and goodwill towards men. Both are true. This book was written in such a way 
that it's actually only understood in relationship. You can get principles. You can discover a code of ethics for how to live an honest, uh, successful life. You can get that without a relationship. But the mystery of Scripture is actually discerned in the relationship. And the, verse I, the verses I quote often uh, in this regard are out of Proverbs, where he says, don't speak to a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Very next verse, speak to a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. <laughs> Which one did you really mean? He doesn't mind creating conflict because then the only thing I have to do is to draw near to find out what he wants in this moment. Yes. See, he, he creates conflict in thought as an invitation for me to pursue the one who holds all mystery. Yes. To walk away offended is to miss the point. The scripture says, Straight and narrow is the way into the kingdom. And then it describes Jesus as being the door, the only door through which there is entrance to the Father. Straight and narrow, Jesus is the door. There are not many ways to God. There are not many doors. There's only one way. There's only one door. If there's many roads that take you to God, then he was cruel in requiring Jesus to suffer and die the way he did. It was required because it was the only possible solution for the sin problem. Right. So we have this straight and narrow road. And I remember in the early 70s, I remember the Lord was just dealing with me. I was raised in church. I, 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 I lived a, a decent life. I came to everything. But he, he knows the heart of hearts. And I remember him dealing with me so deeply. I would listen to, I would show up anytime Mario Morello was preaching because he would just draw a line in the sand and just basically say, you're either in or you're out. And I would, you know, week after week, month after month. And I remember on a Saturday night being in my bedroom, knowing that the dealing of the Lord was on me and he was, he was wanting to know, would I come to the place where it would be all or nothing? And I'll, I'll never forget the Saturday night. I, I, I went into the, uh, the front bathroom in our house and I remember just being there just praying because I could tell that conviction, you know, that drawing of the Lord, that conviction was on me so strong I couldn't live with myself. And I finally came to that place where I said, yes, it's all or nothing. And I remember it's, it's, that, it's that door. It's, it's those, this whole journey is a restricted journey. You don't do what you want. You, you only do what he empowers, enables, directs you to do. But something happened where I entered into a life that's no longer a straight and narrow road. It's the craziest thing. I'm, I'm here walking a tightrope, and he says, what do you want? And I go, what do you mean, what do I want? All I want is what you want. He said, no, that's not the deal. The deal is I'm trying to shape my heart. I'm trying to shape your heart with my heart, and I want to hear back from you. What's your dream? Well, all I want is, is, is just to please you. That's all I want. I just want your will. And again, he repeats, I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. What's in your heart? Oh, just tell me what to do. I'm good. You just give me a list. I'm good at lists. Just tell me what to do. I'll do one, two, and three, and I'll please you that way. And it's this relational journey of abandonment and trust that is so uncomfortable to the one who has given all. People who haven't given all, oh yeah, ask me what I want. I'll tell you exactly what I want. I got a list of 400 things that I want. But when the cross comes, you know that you're not to be trusted. And in that newness of life, he starts looking to you as a son and a daughter. And he starts shaping things inside of you. You find yourself dreaming of things you never dreamt of before. You find yourself praying things that never bothered you before. They just, all of a sudden you start praying these certain prayers that you've never prayed before in your life and, and you don't know where they come from, but they just, they just kind of emanate from you and, 
And the Lord is just discipling, training us in his heart so that we become daily expressions of his heartbeat. So that unconsciously I pray and cry out and do the things that represent his heart well. It's not because I'm a good servant. I want to be the servant. But what he's wanting from me is to be the son the son who gets behind the scenes and finds out why he thinks the way he thinks and what he dreams about, what he plans, what he desires. It's not just the list of qualifications. It's the heart of a son. And that's really what a disciple is. A disciple embraces the cross because that's the responsibility. The resurrection, the reward is his job. So I seek first the kingdom His job is to add all these things. And the challenge of my life is to make the things that are added not my focus, but my occasion to give thanks. The moment I turn my attention from seeking first the king and his kingdom to the rewards of my past choices, I lose both. I don't mean I'm you know, lose salvation. I mean, I mean, just that connection to purpose starts to diminish. That sharp edge of impact, I start living off of memories. And the tragedy is people that are not in love end up doing ministry out of memory instead of imagination. It's tragic for us ever to be taught by people who are not in love. It's a, it's a journey of romance. It's a journey of surrender. It's a journey of the cross. It's the, it's the cross. The most, the most privileged opportunity I have is, is to die because it gives him the occasion to bring resurrection, to bring reward, to bring honor. He says, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he will exalt in proper time. He will exalt. See, if I fight for self-promotion, I have to fight to keep my promotion. But when it's his promotion, he fights to keep the promotion. Turn uh, to John chapter 13. I remember some years ago walking through a Pretty challenging situation relationally. And I just had this realization how much pain it caused me on the inside. This breach in relationship. And you know, when, when you have a conflict, the cool thing about Arguing in your head is you win every argument. I am always right in this throne room right here. I am always, in fact, I am so right. <laughs> you get the point. And I realized you only feel pain where you're not dead. All right, on that happy thought, let's just move on. So what I did is I just, I made very deliberate choices. All right, I am going to choose the cross. I'm going to honor this person that has dishonored me. I'm going to serve the person that wants nothing to do with me. I'm going to get in the secret place and pray for their blessing on their behalf, even though they have labeled me such and such. The point is, you can't sit there and just feel pain. You must move into the glorious posture that we have before God of bringing about righteous fruit of our relationship. Yep, amen to all of that. Let's, let's, uh, read, let's read some more Bible. All right, John 13, verse 35. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. I don't know how many of you have ever studied the alls of the Bible, but they are some of the greatest promises in the Bible. 
Um, and I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And then I hear people say, well, that's, that's referring to a representation of every tribe and tongue. Well, that's fine. Let him figure that out. It's not what he said. He said something that was to invite us into negotiations. Negotiations, not that we need to persuade him, but that we need to learn how to partner with him. What does he say here? He says, by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Look at John 15. I love this verse in John 15 so much. We'll actually read two, verse uh, seven and eight. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit, so you will be my disciples. I know I, I hear people say a lot, bearing much fruit here is the fruit of the Spirit, and that's dealt with el elsewhere. The context here is answers to prayer is the fruit. The context in this passage is that fruit is answers to prayer. I, I got a greater response out of the drum because it says truth on the top of it. So it's just messing with it. Truth. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Benny and I, uh, in the last year, bought a new home and we're remodeling it and, and we're, we're, just, we're having so much fun because we just get to experiment and change our mind and all kinds of stuff. It's just fun. Thank you, Jesus, for... Joshua LaFrance and his team that is very patient, and my sister. Uh, we planted an orchard. We got a, close to 30 trees in this little orchard. I've wanted an orchard ever since we first got married, and we've never been able to do it. I finally got an orchard. I got like 30 trees. I may end up with 100 just because I can. Who knows? Who knows? We, we have a little Polaris. We, we live about oh, probably a quarter mile or maybe a little more from the highway where they pick up the trash. So when we bought the place, I had to buy a Polaris with a little trailer to put the trash cans in it to drive to the road. Will of God. Will of God. Just say it with me. Will of God. is the will of God. There's no question. Will of God. And so Benny and I will go on a little grandma and grandpa tour of our property. And we have several acres. And so we drive down this little trail on the Polaris and drive around the trees. And we walk among the trees. We bless the trees. I haven't prophesied yet, but it's coming. I can feel it coming. You will bear abundantly. You know, I, I've hung, hung around trees before, and I've never once heard them groan or travail. I've never heard them muttering under their leaves. I claim fruit to come forth from me. I claim it, I declare it, I confess it, I proclaim it. I will be fruitful. It, it, uh, it, it's, that's not the responsibility. The only responsibility the tree has is to absorb moisture and nutrients. It's to stay connected to life. And this chapter in John 15 is about a branch that stays connected to life. Its only job is to stay connected to life. And when it stays connected to life, fruit is automatic. Fruit is automatic. If the fruit truly is answers to prayer, think of it this way. This abiding relationship with God, let's be specific, this abiding interaction with the heart and the face of God causes answers to prayer as normal, to happen as normal as breathing. Because our heartbeat is the heart of God. Our cries are the cries of God. We partner with him as co-laborers. The very thing he sought for from the very beginning when he assigned Adam and Eve specifically, be fruitful, multiply, subdue the earth. Here's your assignment. Represent me over a planet. This co-laboring role that we've all been invited into here is found in the life of a disciple. When we stop learning, we stop being a disciple. And this issue of learning is this, it's this embrace 
It just sounds morbid. I get it. It sounds, it sounds morbid. It's just the embracing of the cross. It's the privilege to say no to what I would naturally do so that I can make an occasion for you to do what you would naturally do. Years ago, I had a friend in, in Weaverville that uh, had another friend that lived out of the area. Um, and and his, my buddy's name's Tom. Some of my Weaverville friends here remember Tom. This guy loved to fish, and he was, he was a good fisherman. And he had a friend who lived in one of the bigger cities. I forget where. I think it might have been the Bay Area. And he called, she, the wife called Tom one day and said, Hey, Tom, would you take my husband fishing on such and such a date these days? And he said, Oh, yeah. He says, I'd love to. So they arranged it secretly. She never told the husband. She called the boss, the husband's boss, for him to have those days off, packed his gear packed his luggage, packed everything for him, picked him up at work one day and said, you're going fishing with Tom. And the guy says, I, have, um, I can't do that. I work tomorrow. No, it's already covered. I've already taken care of it. Yeah, but I've got to go home and I've got to, I've got to do this. I said, no, it's already covered. Look in the back seat. It's all there. She actually fought for his blessing. What tastes better when you fight for your own blessing or you taste of somebody else's effort to fight for your blessing. What, what fishing trip will this guy remember the rest of his life as a fisherman who fishes frequently? What's the one trip he will never forget is the one his wife fought for. Amen. See, this life of a disciple, in, amen, amen. <laughs> Jay, you and me, come on. I'll fight for yours, you fight for mine. How's that? All right, all right. We're there, come on. Now I forgot my point. No, I... <laughs> that's, that's seeking first the kingdom. I have chosen to represent the Lord well by dying to what I would naturally do. He steps in. And he said, let me handle this one for you. When that happens, the only things you have added to your life are the things that come because of the cross. Because of his yes over your yes. When I complicate my life with my striving for promotion or whatever, it becomes more and more difficult to discern what he brought into my life and what I brought into my life. It affects devotion. It affects worship. It affects priorities. It affects discernment. It affects all those parts of life become affected and infected because we don't know what we fought for and what he fought for. The life of the disciple is the life of the cross. It is saying yes to God. And I'll never forget that night. I started talking about it a minute ago. I had, I had been immersed in Mario and some other folks' preaching, Mario Murillo. And I, I, I sat there in my room, finally in the bathroom. And his hand was so heavy upon me and I remember just saying, all right, I give it all. I didn't care. I loved to hunt and fish. It honestly didn't matter to me if I ever hunted or fished again. I didn't care if I owned any clothes besides what was on my back. I mean, it was, it was such an absolute yes that everything, every ambition, every goal I'd had for my life, everything was put on that altar, everything. And in that yes... All that mattered to me was just doing what he said. I didn't care. I didn't care. I just didn't care. I didn't care about anything but my yes. And gradually he began to add into my life. It made me nervous. It made me nervous. Jesus said that to his disciples. I'll add a hundred times as much what you sacrificed back into your life. That, that's, that's, that makes me nervous. It's almost easier to not have the reward. 
because you, you get accustomed to that yes. And now the Lord is saying, all right, that wilderness where you had nothing was to train you for a promised land where you could steward everything well for my glory. And the Lord is looking to take you and me on a crosswalk where he can trust you with the kinds of resources of anointing, of favor, of insight, of finances, of position, not because those things represent spirituality, but because those are positions in society that can be used to disciple nations. And without it, there will be no discipling of nations. There must be a way to handle well when somebody gets promoted. And in our heart of hearts, because we've dealt with a jealousy issue, I clearly discern Jesus has just exalted this man. Jesus has just promoted this woman. And it is foolish to not have favor on what God favors. I've had people that just personality-wise, they've just annoyed me to pieces. And I've, I've, had, I've had to come to the realization, man, God's favor is on them. If I don't put my favor in with God's favor, I am the fool. I am the fool. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> throughout, throughout my, I'll, I'll end with this. I'm, my, my yes, my yes, absolute yes. the Lord would add into my life. And then I would start looking at what he was adding. And I'd say, God, I've got, to keep, I've got to keep that absolute yes at the core of who I am. So can I give this away? I want my priority of the kingdom to be so strong and stable that no reward will distract me. Can I give this away? I'd see him add, see him add. That's all right. It's awesome. I want to invest this here. I want to show this here. And then he adds and he adds. I, 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 I become so conscious of the need for the absolute yes. I, I just, I have to take this stuff and just put it back on an altar and just say, you, you brought this into my life. I never asked for it. I didn't seek for it. It was never my priority. My priority was just knowing, knowing that you were pleased. That's all that mattered. All that mattered to me is that I could say yes that delighted your heart. And then you've brought this in my life. And I'm so glad. I'm so thankful. But I don't ever want to get to a place where the reward turns me from seeking first the kingdom to seeking what you could fill my life with. Oh, sorry about that. I'm over it now. I wish. <laughs> I wish it were that easy. Oh. It's the coolest thing in the world to know in your heart of hearts that you'll do anything he says. Yes, sir. That nothing is held closer to your heart yeah. than him. And when he said... If you love your mom and dad or you love your kids more than you love me, you're not worthy of me. He wasn't punishing us or putting us in a position to be irreverent or inconsiderate of our family. He was basically saying this, if you put me first, you'll be much more qualified to love them well. The best thing you could do for your children is put me first. Your love for them will be life altering. 
Why don't you stand? If I could get everyone to just hold their place for a moment, it would help us out. Anytime we have this many folks in a room, I know there's always a chance that the Lord has managed to bring people in that don't have a personal relationship with Him. You don't know what it is to be forgiven of sin, don't know what it is to be born again is the biblical term, so where you're transformed from the inside out. It's not a list of rules you adhere to. It's a transformation that comes from surrender. And if there's anybody in the room that just said, Bill, I don't want to leave the building till I know that I'm at peace with God, till I know what it is to be forgiven, to be born again. One of the other things that Jesus said that has been so much at the forefront of my thinking in recent months, actually, he said, what does it profit a person if they gain the whole world and lose their own soul? What does it profit a person if they get every promotion, every goal they reach, everything they've ever longed for is poured into their life, but they lose their own soul? What do they have? They have nothing, nothing. And this issue of salvation is not something any of us can do for ourselves. Jesus alone forgives, heals, and restores. And so if there's anyone here today that would just say, Bill, I don't want to leave the building until I know I'm at peace with God, then I invite you. Put a hand up. And by doing so, you're acknowledging that you want to be a disciple of Jesus, and we will pray with you. Right over here. Beautiful. <laughs> Wonderful. Anybody else? Nope. It's the most important decision you'll ever make. Anybody else? Wave, wave your hand at me. I want to make sure that I, that I see if there's anybody else. So another one here. Oh, right down here. Thank you. Wonderful. Bless you. Yeah. Yeah, the Lord's going to lift that broken thing off you in such a beautiful way, bring wholeness to you. It's beautiful. Anybody else real quickly? Uh, I know on Bethel TV, there's countless numbers of people, nations all over the world. We invite you to do the same thing. Yeah. Make this personal response to the Lord Jesus Christ. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask for our ministry team come to the front. And while we do this, the two that I saw, if there's others, make your way right down here to these friends of ours. To my left, they have their hands up. We know and trust them. It's not about becoming a member of Bethel. It's about being in fellowship with God himself. I want you to come down here, and they will pray for you, talk with you right over here. Yeah, go right over here to my left. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Thank you. Beautiful. I love it. I love it. All right. Come, come. So good. I'm sorry, Tom. I, I told you to come up and then I took the mic. <laughs> in, <clears throat> there's this great verse in Isaiah 50, and it makes this statement it says that he awakens me morning by morning with the ear of a disciple. He awakens me morning by morning with the ear of a disciple. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to pray that God invade your night in such a way that tomorrow morning something takes place where you awaken with the joy of saying yes to him, yes to him, so that he can say yes over that resurrection display over your life. So Father, we pray just that. I ask that in the night tonight and in, in our life now from this point on, that you'd help us to awaken every day with the ear of a disciple. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, pay attention to this guy and he'll tell you what to do. Put your hand on your heart there just for a second. I know this might feel uncomfortable for some of you guys, but I want us to just, if you can, lift your voices and just pray in the Spirit for just a minute. Just, just, just go for 30 seconds. Just pray in the Spirit. Just giving God your yes. Let's just give him our yes and just pray. If you're online right now, just pray. Just say, yes, God. Yes, God. 
Ramosso Toruba Satara. Yes, God, just tell him yes, just tell him yes. Yes, God. Yes, Lord. Just put your hand on the neighbor next to you. Just, just let it increase right now. <laughs> let it increase. Let rivers of living water just begin to flow right now. Yes, God. Yes, God. Not enough to be a hearer of the word. We've got to be doers. Amen. Lest we deceive our own selves and think we're disciples. Yes, Lord. Search us and know us, God. Test our hearts, God. See where we're at, Lord. Just rip out jealousy. Come on, let's repent right now. Take jealousy, Jesus. Take self-promotion, Father. Thank you for revealing it in me, God, even. Lord, we're, we choose to die with you today, Lord. Come on, church. Jesus, we declare you Lord of our lives. Thank you, Lord. Come on. Come on, it's so hard to close these services sometimes because I just want to turn it into a prayer meeting. <laughs> but hey, if you need ministry in this place, if you need healing in your body, you know, you know what to do. We've got lots of people up here that are ready to pray for you. And uh, every week there's miracles that happen up here where we just come together in prayer and we see Jesus get what he paid for. Amen? Amen. And so why don't you go ahead and make your way forward if you need prayer. If not, God bless you. We'll see you tonight. 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 See you tonight.